meditation. And so now I have the anointing to blow power transformers, okay? So that'll be the, that'll be the thing I start trying to do is blow a power transformer. But anyway, let's go ahead and we'll turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to review just really quick. We've been, this is going to be part 7 in our series on the church, on Ecclesia. And uh, I want to just spend a little bit of time reviewing because we've gotten, gotten deep, deep here and we want to just take a high level view and step back to find out exactly, you know, what we've been talking about. Um, I do have to say I still, I'm, I have beach brain because I was at the beach all last week. So if I say anything dumb, it's because my brain's still half asleep. So hopefully it'll come back, come back awake. But in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22... Paul is writing and he says he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. And that word in the Greek is ekklesia, which we've been talking about for seven weeks now. Gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. I want you to catch that because we are so locked in to what we think the church is, we miss what Scripture defines the church to be. See, the church is not a building we go to. The church is not a two-hour service we attend. See, the church is not something we do once a week. Paul tells us right here, the church is his body. When you think of the church, I want you to start thinking people, not building. When you think of the church, I want you to start thinking the body of Christ and not where we go on Sunday. It's a hard thing to get out of our mindsets. We're so locked in. We've been so ingrained by what church has become, passed down to us for 1,700 years. It's hard to get into our thinking what the church is scripturally. Now, I emailed this out to us last week or the week before, but I'm, I want to just go through the comparison between the traditional institutional church and the organic New Testament church. And, and so I sent this out on an email, but I, I didn't print the notes today. But the, the traditional institutional church is a mixture of pagan practices a mixture of pagan practices and Christianity, which has been handed down to us from the Roman Empire. The organic New Testament church was handed down to us by the apostles. See, the institutional church has been in place for the past 1,700 years after Constantine. And so much of what the church has become is because of what Constantine did back in the year around 325 A.D., now, the New Testament organic church was in place for the first 300 years of the church. See, the, the mindset of the traditional institutional church is church is a place you go on Sunday. The New Testament church is supposed to be a people who gather together regularly. I want us to, I, again, I want to say this again to us. Church is not a place we go to on Sunday. Church is the people who gather together. Church in the, in the traditional mindset is a building. Church in the New Testament is Christ's very own body. Those who have his indwelling life gathering together. It's a very different concept. See, church is, and based on the traditional institutional model, is a two-hour service, one-hour service if you're seeker-sensitive, with music, a message, and ministry. But the organic New Testament church is a gathering of Christ's body under the headship of Jesus Christ. It's where we wait on Him and learn to express His indwelling life together. See, t we, we saw a beautiful example of that this morning where we just said, okay, we don't know what else to do. We're going to wait on the Lord for a few minutes, and the Lord broke in in a beautiful way. That's meant to be normal, the normal expression of the life of Jesus Christ. The institutional church 
is an organization under the government of man. The, the New Testament church, the organic church, is a living organism under the headship of Christ. See, what we think of in the traditional church, the traditional church service is comprised mostly of consumers who pay their tithe, and in exchange for their tithe, they get an anointed worship band and an anointed, eloquent speaker, and then they go home and live their normal life. I mean, isn't that what most of what church has become in the Western world? Church in the New Testament is a gathering of active participators who have sought the Lord on their own for a word, a spiritual song, a, a teaching, a psalm, or something to contribute to the meaning. They've taken ownership of it. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. See, one is a consumer-driven model, and the other is a participatory model of the body. See, the, the, the New Testament church is the participators have taken ownership and responsibility for each gathering. And we learn how to express the indwelling life of Jesus Christ together, interdependently. It's a very different... The, the New Testament church is so different to what we have become accustomed to. The traditional institutional church depends upon the pastor and the worship team to experience God. So, in other words, you can't encounter God and you can't experience God except by the anointed man of God and the anointed worship band. The New Testament expression of the church is an interdependent body of individuals who know how to experience God on their own in the secret place but they also realize their great need for each other and they learn to function interdependently by the life of Jesus Christ. It's making sense? We got to hear this over and over because it's so easy to get locked into the, the traditional normal way of what church has become. See, the institutional church can function without the Holy Spirit and no one even notices. That's scary. Most churches, or many churches today, are not operating in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and if the, the Holy Spirit is not even present in a lot of churches, yet no one even notices. The, the well-oiled machine of what's called the church is functioning by the gifts and the talents and the skills and the creativity of its leaders. And no one even notices. No one even notices that God is not in that place. It just moves and functions like a weld old machine. The organic New Testament church can only operate by divine life. See, if we don't have divine life, the organic New Testament church dies out. The organic church, the New Testament church, can only operate by divine life. If the Holy Spirit does not show up, and the Holy Spirit does not give leadership and direction, then that church, that church no longer exists. It's, we are utterly and totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. See the need there? There is no such thing as church in God's eyes apart from divine life, apart from the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. See, the institutional church is, a, is, a, is made up of a leadership hierarchical, is, where leadership is hierarchical and positional, where the main leader has a special title and gives chain of command orders to those, quote unquote, under him. The New Testament church is a leadership team of elders who function as shepherds, and together this team pastors and oversees the church and watches over them as, as a sheep. The traditional institutional church is led by one pastor. 
The organic New Testament church is led by a team of pastors. The traditional church is an institution and organization built on org charts and organizational models. But the organic New Testament church is a community, is a family that's based on real authentic relationships that come out of divine life. See, I think what the Lord wants to highlight is the incredible gap between what church is meant to be as defined by the New Testament and what church has become for the past 1,700 years from what Constantine handed down to us in 325 A.D. or whatever the exact year was. See, God wants, I believe the Lord is moving to bring a hammer and a demolition to the old wineskin of what we think church is so that he can establish a new wineskin of what church is meant to be through his eyes so that he can pour the new wine of the Holy Spirit into a new wineskin. And that's what we've been focusing on for the past seven weeks. Now, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 14.26. You still with me, everyone? You seem like you're in beach mode. It seems like your brain is in beach mode. Are we still awake? Okay, all right. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Paul wrote this. Here's what's shocking about this verse of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Paul wrote this to a carnal group of people. Paul wrote this to the carnal Corinthians where strife and jealousy and sexual immorality and all kinds of childish behavior had crept in. And almost every leader would say, why, Paul, are you going to say this when the church is so carnal? I can't even think of one leader who would actually encourage the, the, the gifts of the Spirit to function and the body to function in an open and a participatory, participatory way. I can't even imagine that a leader would encourage that with such carnality going on. And yet Paul says to us, here's what he says, when you assemble, each one has a psalm, each one has a teaching, each one has a revelation, each one has a tongue, each one has an interpretation, that all things be done for edification. See, Paul is telling us the church was never, ever meant to be a one-man show where one man, one anointed man under the Holy Spirit's power with gifts and talents is the source or the key for you to connect with God. The, the Holy Spirit was saying, or what Paul was saying is the church, the ecclesia is a body and everyone must flow and function together as one body. We're never, it was never intended where we just wake up as a good consumer, pay our tithe. Now, that doesn't mean don't pay your tithe. But wake up, pay our tithe, come as a consumer, give a good five-star review to the message, say the, the music was good, the message was good, go home, live our life. That was never God's intention for the ecclesia. That was never God's intention for the church. That is what Americans do, business-minded Americans do, when they get a hold of God's church, is they turn it into a business and they turn the, the, the people of God into consumers who come and sit. We don't have pews, but come sit in chairs and give their five-star review of good or bad. Did I feel God or not? And I've been doing this long enough to realize that model does not work. It does not raise up. And it can't work because God has, has, has ordained it not to work. The, the body grows when every one, every joining piece of the body connected to each other contributes what Christ has done in them. But again, it can only function by divine life. If you're not living by divine life, if you're not living by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, then you cannot contribute to the body. That's why living by his life is so vital. And so Paul lays this out for us of what his vision is for the church, the church to function in uh, as one body. Now, in verse 40, let's, let's, let's move down to verse 40. This is, this is very, very important. 
Here's what Paul says, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. See, divine order, that's what God wants to establish. That's what God wants to do in the body. God wants to have an interdependent body functioning by divine life in divine order. It's so critical to have the order of God in the service. I have been doing this long enough. I've been helping to lead and leading a charismatic church for over 25 years now. And I have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of the charismatic movement. I could tell you story after story after story of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And like I said a couple weeks ago... I decided to come up with what I've called the Charismania Kids. I, I, I was inspired by the Garbage Pail Kids. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but I know my brother had every single Garbage Pail Kit card you could possibly have back in the mid-80s. I think it was 1985. And these, these Garbage Pail Kids were these characterizations of, it was kind of a parody of the uh, Cabbage Patch Kids, that was, you know, you, as a kid growing up, you would go buy these cards and they would have the, all these funny little characters. But I took that and I created what I call the Charismania Kids. Now, the Charismania Kids are an accumulation of real life people, real life experiences. But of course, I'm having a little bit of fun and throwing in some good exaggeration to create some characters who I believe can help us learn about divine order. Now, the other thing I want to say, uh, I, I didn't mention this in the message, but I mentioned at the end of the message, is I'm also teaching this because anyone who's going to come in new who wants to participate in our meetings will also have need to listen to these teachings. So we have divine order. And so I, I, do, I, I try to think of every single case. So sometimes you might think, well, that doesn't really apply here. It could apply in the future. So we don't know who's going to come. All right. So. That's why I did this. So we have the Charismania Kids. Last, last message, we talked about close talker Carl. And I had a few people come up to me after the service and get right in my face and start talking just to kind of joke around with me. But close talker Carl, he, just a quick review, close talker Carl is a close talker. Every time he talks, he gets right in your face. I mean, you can literally smell his breath. You can tell if he's brushed his teeth or not. You take one step back, he takes one step forward until you're finally pinned in the corner. Close talker Carl does not have any self-awareness. Close talker Carl blows the shofar after every important message, 30 times in a message. And so we talked about close talker Carl. We also talked about puffed up Patrick. And puffed up Patrick is a person who walks in pride, doesn't see his own pride, and we learned a lot of lessons about pride and the need to walk in honor and humility. So I just would encourage you, get the last message, and you can hear about it. Now, the problem I'm having with this is I'm having way too much fun doing this that this, this series could literally last for like the next eight weeks because I keep thinking of more and more and more people. Today we're going to talk about Messenger Mitch. Messenger Mitch. See, Messenger Mitch is a messenger of the Lord, at least in his own mind. Messenger Mitch, his heroes are Elijah and John the Baptist. Messenger Mitch, his dream is to go into a church in America and, and call down the fire of God from heaven upon the carnal and lukewarm Christians who are not seeking God like he is. See, Messenger Mitch, his, for his birthday, Messenger Mitch wants a camel's hair cloak from Israel. He wants a Moses replica staff, and he, instead of a birthday cake, he wants locusts and honey from the Middle East. Messenger Mitch is super, super intense. Messenger Mitch does not think he can give a prophetic word unless he calls you to repentance. He, if, he thinks he's, if he says something nice to you, he feels like he's shifted into what he thinks is hyper grace. See, Messenger Mitch says... Okay, if, if I'm going to give a word, I've got to lead you to repentance. Because there's, there's no such thing as a prophetic word without repentance. There's no such thing as a prophetic word without calling you to get on your knees and repent before God. He can't even think of anything that would, you know, any, he can't even comprehend that God might call someone to be led to repentance by his love and his kindness and his grace. All right, that's obviously a very harsh 
extreme form of exaggeration. But we can learn something from Messenger Mitch. Number one is, is this is the lessons we can learn from Messenger Mitch, is number one, a true messenger wants people to hear what God speaks through them. Now, I have, I used to have a little bit of Messenger Mitch in me where I got to the point where I was like, I don't care who listens to me. I don't, I don't have the fear of man. The fear of man brings a snare. It's like, I don't really care if you hear me or not. I am going to be a faithful messenger of the Lord, and I'm going to speak the word of God without any fear of man. And the Lord just kind of had to bring me back and say, okay, you actually need to love and care for the people you're speaking to, Brian. Oh, okay. It's not enough just to be delivered from the fear of man, which is a good thing. We don't want to have the fear of man. But the, not having the fear of man does not mean that we can be rude and harsh and severe in the name of I don't have the fear of man. Let me ask you a question. Do you, and answer this question. And, and let me just say this before I get started. When I talk about being a messenger, we often think... We often think a stage and a microphone. We often think a platform. Okay, I don't want you to think a platform. I want you to think whoever God would have you speak to, whether it's on a platform, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's through writing, and now most importantly, in your house, in your work. See, we get so spiritual that we try to be messengers in the house of God, but yet in the marketplace or in the house, we don't do this. You see the hypocrisy here. I want us to read 1 Timothy chapter 3. I want us to get a biblical order. We're talking about divine order, where there's some divine order that needs to be established in, in our thinking. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I, I just have seen this recently, just with some different events going on in the church, is we really don't understand, the body of Christ does not understand the, the uh, requirements for those who are going to have influence in, in the body of Christ. I mean, it's a serious thing to have influence in the body of Christ. It's a serious thing to speak to one of God's children. It's a serious thing to speak to your own children. But Paul is writing in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4, he's talking about leadership. But he says, one who's going to be an elder, who wants to be an elder or an overseer, he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. Now, verse 5 says, but if a man does not know how to manage his own house, how can he take care of God's church? Now, here's the point, and I know some people are like, well, I'm not really called to leadership. Here's the point. What God wants to do is establish divine order starting within us internally. And having that divine order internally, it then flows out of us. In fact, when Paul is laying out leadership criteria, back in verse, verse 2, he says, though, he says that one of the qualifications is an overseer must be respectable. In the, in the New American Standard translation, it says respectable. That word actually comes from the Greek word cosmos, which means well and orderly. And just as the world that God created is perfect and, is, and the way is ordered and arranged, it just, just the, the genius wisdom of God in his creative order, what Paul is telling us is that anyone who's going to be a leader needs to be orderly. Now, that, that, that is talking, I believe, first about an inward, internal orderliness inside. And that orderliness begins with you internally and then flows out to how you speak to your spouse, how you speak to your children, how you speak to your, at, at your workplace, and then how you speak in the church. You see what I'm saying here? Is God's order is first yourself, then your spouse, 
then your children, then your work, then at church. What we do is we, we just throw away all the other stuff like spouse work, children, and we get in the, in the house of God and we put on a mask and we speak in a certain way in the church, yet in the other places we don't have divine order. No, divine order flows first within you, then to your spouse, then to your kids, then to your work, then in the house of God. If you don't get any of the other stuff right, you'll never get this, this right here. And if you get this right here and you don't have that right, you're just a hypocrite. So we want to get how we speak. Now, this is why I'm saying this. How we speak as a messenger, whether you're speaking to one person, whether you're speaking to your kids, whether you're speaking to your coworker, whether you're speaking to your spouse, all of us are messengers of God. Some might have a bigger platform. Some might have more influence. But every one of us have, you know, where, wherever God would use you to speak, and, and we're going to ultimately get to how you would speak in the body, in the church, we got to ask ourselves this question. Do you want to be, ask yourself, do you want to be a messenger who speaks what God says, or do you want to be a messenger who people hear what God speaks through you? I'm looking at you and you're all like, what's the difference? Let me say it again. Think about it for a minute. Actually, think, think about it for a minute. Think about the difference. Do you want to be a messenger who, God, who speaks what God says? Or do you want to be a messenger who people hear what God speaks through you? See, the first one, if I want to be a messenger and my only concern is I want to be the mouthpiece of God, I want to speak what God says, I don't, see, what happens is I get to the place where I don't really care about the people I'm speaking to. I just want to be the prophet. I just want to be the mouthpiece of God. I just want to be the voice of God from the throne. I don't really care about the people I'm speaking to. I've been there. I was that way for a long time. That's better than not being a messenger at all. But there's something better God wants for us, whether we're speaking to our children, whether we're speaking to whoever, to a, on a platform or whatever. God wants something greater that we want to be people who care what, how that people hear what God is speaking through us. See, because if we don't care, if we don't care if the people that are listening to us hear from God through us, then it doesn't matter how we speak. We'll just get up there without any worry or concern about tone or speech or the words we use or what we say to people. We'll just get up and say, repent, the Lord's saying this, this, and this. And we don't really care if the people we're speaking to hear us, right? But if we care, if we want people to receive what we say, then we, then we, begin, we love the people we speak to. We'll make sure, okay, is the way I'm speaking the best way for what I'm trying to achieve? It, it, am I using the right tone? Am I using the right speech? Am I using the right words? Am I using the right mood? Am I using the right analogies? And all the stuff we begin, not only are we the messenger of the Lord, we're hearing from the Lord, but we also have a, a concern for the people we speak to, whether that's your children, whether that's your, in, the, in the house of God. See, if all you want to do is be a messenger who speaks what God says, it's actually selfish. It sounds so self-righteous. It sounds like you're just one of these John the Baptist types. I don't really care, no fear of man. But it's actually selfish because the only thing you're caring about is your own responsibility to be faithful to God. You're not caring about the people he loves and them responding to the message you speak. You see what I'm saying? You see the difference. See, one is you're just concerned about yourself and your responsibility before God. The second way is we care also what, what we want to be faithful to what God's saying, but we also care deeply about the people we speak to. We want them to hear that message and so we will spend time praying for them. We will spend time 
um, interceding. We will spend time thinking, okay, what's the best way I can say this message so that they can hear what God's speaking to me? The second thing, the second lesson we can learn from Messenger Mitch is that if we want to speak God's word, sermons, teachings, prophetic words to his people, it's so, so important to have a shepherd's heart. I I don't think... And I say this because before I was like, well, I'm a prophet of the Lord. I don't, I don't need this shepherd's heart stuff. That, that is just such false thinking. Revelation 7, it talks about Jesus Christ, and, he says, and it says the lamb at the center of the, of the throne is a shepherd. Jesus Christ himself is a shepherd, and we are his sheep. God wants us as messengers who are going to speak what God speaks to us for the people he will tell us to speak to, God wants us to embody the shepherd's heart. There's no getting around it. I've seen so much in the modern day prophetic movement who had zero shepherd's heart. That's not the Lord. You might be hearing some, you might be hearing what God's saying, but you don't have the Lord's heart. Everyone who is a true messenger of the Lord carries the shepherd's heart of Jesus Christ. The love and the care and the compassion for the people that we speak to. That's what God wants from us. We, we, we want to carry the Lord's heart. You know, what are the people going through that we're speaking? You know, we don't want to just give you, just imagine a prophetic word. You're going to give a prophetic word to someone. Do you really know what they're going through? Do you really know the struggles they're encountering? Do you know the trials they've been through? Do you know what they, their, their last week and month has been like, the last six months? And we just get up and we just throw out this word to them without having any of a shepherd's heart. God wants us to carry the shepherd's heart for the people we speak to, whether it's a message, a teaching, a prophecy, or whatever it is, God wants us to carry the shepherd's heart. He cares so deeply about his people. He wants us to have that embodiment of love and compassion and concern and care. And then having his heart for the people, we can then speak the truth and speak it in a way that they can hear it. Let's look at Jeremiah 3, verse 15. This is so important in the prophetic movement. Having been in the prophetic movement for 20 plus years, and having seen many quote unquote messengers out there who would just have no concern or care for the people they speak to, I being one of them in the past, I say this that this is so important that. Jeremiah 3.15, then I will give you shepherds after my own heart. That's what we want to be. Now, ultimately, he's talking about pastors and leaders, but you know whether you're going to speak a message to your children, whether you're going to speak a message to five people or a platform room of people or you're going to write a book or whatever, we want to be a shepherd after God's heart. See, the first thing Jesus said to Peter After he denied him, he said to him, Peter, feed my sheep. That's the shepherd heart of Jesus Christ. Jesus is a shepherd. Jesus has great care for his sheep. Jesus has great concern for his people. And he wants everyone who would speak in any capacity for him to carry his shepherd's heart, to carry... This is not just for a pastor. This is not just for a leader. It's meant to be the entire body. We are the body of Christ. We're to embody the shepherd's heart of Jesus Christ and so that our communication and how we speak carries and reflects his shepherd's heart. 
The third thing is we need to learn from Messenger Mitch is we want to speak the truth in love, seasoned with grace. We want to speak the truth in love, seasoned with grace. See, we don't want to just speak the truth. We want to speak it in love. That's what Paul said in Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. No matter what, we want to make sure, okay, lo- this is what love says. When, when, when you've got a, a, a truthful message to speak, love says, okay, What is the best way for this particular person who is unique or this crowd of people who is unique or this group of people who are unique in their characteristics? What is the best way that I can use to speak to them or to speak to this crowd or to speak to this person? What's the best tone? What's the best mood? I mean, sometimes it might be that we need the the preaching voice of God to break through the blinders that are blinding them, but love moves us. Sometimes the people are so deaf, they need to hear a voice of one crying in the wilderness to break through the hardness of heart so they can hear. But love is what moves us. Sometimes a a gentle reed, he will not break. Sometimes someone is so broken, someone is so you know, been through such a hard season, the last thing they need is a harsh, challenging word. They need to be encouraged. They need to be edified. They need to be built up. Sometimes people need a confrontation like Jesus did with the Pharisees. Sometimes people need, like the woman at the well or the woman caught in adultery, they need the grace of God. So love says, what's the best way for me to speak this truth? What's the best way for me to speak this message that will help those who hear to receive it, to get it, and to be transformed by it. Mike Bickle believes that for every word of correction we speak, we should speak ten words of encouragement. That's pretty good. Think about how we speak. Let's just, let's just bring this first, okay? It's easy to put on a charismatic Christian mask, come to church, and speak the truth in love. It's easy to do that. How well do you do it in your house? Because that's really who you are. How do you speak to your kids? How do you speak? Do you speak out of anger? Now, all of us have obviously spoken out of anger. But I remember when Anna was first born, I thought the only way I could ever speak to her to correct her was to scream at the top of my lungs and just you know storm at her. And I realized, okay, this isn't working. It actually stirs in her more rebellion and anger. So I changed and I said, okay, you know, that is not the way I need to be speaking to her. I need to speak. Now, there are, trust me, there are times when I need to just say, Anna, stop right now. And it has to break something. There's a time for that. Don't get me wrong. But my default mode of speaking to her was always angry and mean, all, you know, even in any kind of correction. And so the Lord had to correct me and say, no, why don't you speak the truth in love? Why don't you try gentleness? Gentleness turns away wrath. Why don't you try meekness? Why don't you try saying, hey, sweets, let's not do that right now. See, why don't you try a different method? See, love moves and love motivates us to know how to speak the truth in the right mode, in the right method, in the right tone to accomplish the goal. See, some of us just yell and scream at our kids, and what we're doing is we're actually trying to achieve a certain objective. You know, like, kid, get in the car. You know, that's an example. Get get in the car right now. Get in the car right now. Your goal is to get them in the car, but you're screaming at them, and in getting them in the car, you're imparting to them rejection. You're imparting them condemnation. Why don't you try this? Hey, sweetie, can you get in the car for me, please? Now, there will be a time when they don't obviously heed that, and you've got to change the way you speak. But start with kindness. Start with grace. Start with love. See, we want to be speaking. The, this, the, the, and I'm going to be tested about this. I can't wait to be tested about this. I'm not. <laughs> Angie will be like, speak the truth in love. I don't pass this test every time. Trust me. But I'm working towards it. 
10 words of encouragement for every word of correction. So you don't want to just impart to them your negativity. You don't want to impart to them your anger, or your frustration, or your bitterness. Because why? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not easily provoked. Love is not easily offended. See, when we, we want to speak the truth in love, starting with our, to our spouse, our children. And then if we can get it right with our children and our spouse and our workplace, we can get it right here in the church. So we can look at the Lord Jesus Christ and the way he spoke words of correction to the seven churches in Revelation. He gave words of commendation. He gave words of encouragement. He said, okay, you know, there's, there's some great things you're doing. I love the way you're reaching out. I love the way you're testing the apostles. I love the way you're doing this. I love the way you're doing that. But I have this against you. See, don't just go right in with a word of correction I mean, if you can't find one thing they're doing right, you know, that, that might be the case because Laodicea was the case. Jesus couldn't find one thing they were doing right. But look for the things they're doing right and say, you're doing this really good. I really appreciate the way you worship the Lord. I really appreciate the way you pray. I, I really appreciate that you haven't quit, you haven't given up. I, I really appreciate that. Now, here's what I believe the Lord's saying. You need to move on or press on and go on to maturity, but build them up before giving a word of correction. See, usually people who always speak negative and always see what's wrong with others, they typically have something very wrong in them. Hurting people hurt people. If we have pain internally, we're going to project pain onto people. A root of bitterness defiles many. When bitterness, we have bitterness inside of us, it's going to come out of us. Just put enough pressure on it, get the right situation, get the right circumstances, and your toxic, your, your, the toxic things inside of you are going to be squeezed out. And so we want, to, we want to make sure that if we're going to speak to people, we want to make sure we're not bitter, we're not toxic on the inside. We, haven't, we don't have these wounds of rejection, and we're just speaking out of our rejection. Because here's the thing is, it talks about in James that the tongue is set on fire by hell. Are you prophesying to people what God's speaking, or are you speaking prophetically what the demons are saying? Are you speaking negative over them? Are you speaking curses over them? Are you speaking rejection over them? Are you imparting to them your bitterness? Are you imparting to them your frustration or your anxiety? We don't want to be that way. We, don't want, we want to watch the way we speak with our mouth. See, one of the ways that Jesus sees us, I love this about the Lord, one of the ways the Lord sees us is he sees us by our potential. He told Abraham in his barrenness, you are a father of many nations. And he's like, what? I, I'm like 100 years old and I can't even have kids. He's like, you're a father of many nations. The Lord spoke to him based on his potential. The Lord called Peter and he said, you are a rock, even though he knew Peter would deny him. The Lord saw through him, and he saw his potential. See, so often, we don't see the potential of what people can be. And so we speak to them where they're currently at. We need to be a little more prophetic than that. If we want to be prophetic people, we need to see them 20 years from now, and we need to see them through the eyes of the Lord, and we need to prophesy who they're going to be in Christ. That's the prophetic. It's not this pathetic stuff of, of pointing out all their faults, where they're at now. Yes, there's faults and there's things now. God sees them 20 years from now, and he speaks prophetically to them and says, you are a father of many nations even though you're barren. You are a rock even though you're unstable right now. 
If we want to be like Jesus Christ in how we speak, we need to speak by the potential that people have because of the Spirit of God that dwells in them. See, how are we speaking to our kids? You're never going to do this. You're never going to amount to that. Why don't we look at 20 years from now with Christ dwelling inside of them, what He can do in them and through them and speak to their potential and say, I see you in the future. I see where you're going. And, I, and you speak and you say, you are called to this. You are a rock. You are pure. You're, you know, you're this or you're that. Speak to their potential. I'm not talking about lying to them. I'm talking about truly being prophetic and seeing with God, God's eyes their potential in Jesus Christ and speaking to them and prophesying to them who they can be because of Christ in them. See, we need to be like Christ. We need to be like the Lord who sees those things that are not as though they were. Twenty years from now, what will your kids look like in Jesus Christ? See it. Envision it. Speak to them out of their potential. See what I'm saying? See, we think, here's what we think. We think, so James says, the anger of God will not achieve, or, or the anger of man, the anger of man will not achieve the righteousness of God. Some reason we think if we get angry, if we raise our voice, if we speak with a harsh tone or whatever it is, we think that is going to cause them to all of a sudden be righteous. It's not. You're basically wasting your breath. You're wasting your lungs. You're wasting your voice to do something that's just fruitless. Enough condemning words and they'll start tuning you out. Enough words of condemnation and they won't hear a word you have to say ever again. They'll, they'll just put their fingers in their ears and say da-da-da-da-da and just move on. They are not going to hear you with condemnation after condemnation after condemnation. You might want to think about speaking prophetically by the power of the Holy Spirit into who they can be, into their potential, so that they can become who God wants them to be. And that would apply also in the house of God. You know, we think for some reason it's prophetic to call out everyone's sins. When I first got in the prophetic movement, my goal, this is, sounds, this is, I might blush even saying this, but my goal was ser seriously to be able to prophesy to rooms of thousands of people and call out someone in the back row and say, does room 222 mean anything to you? You're living in adultery. I mean, that was, that was what it might, that's embarrassing, but that's what my dream was as a, as a prophetic voice. That was what I thought it was to be, is to call out people on their sin. God, forgive me. But that's not what it is about. That's not what it's about. Now, there's definitely times when we speak the truth to confront there's definitely times to confront people. There's definitely times to say, hey, you're living in sin. I'm not talking about never confronting. The prophetic is a confrontational ministry. Being a messenger is confrontational. What I'm trying to get at is that we have the shepherd's heart of the Lord. We have his love. We have his care when we speak to them. Let's turn to Colossians 4, verse 6. Colossians 4, verse 6. I, I love this scripture. And I, I'm, I'm wanting to just move in this in a lot greater way. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. To each person. Notice the individual mindset here. How do you respond to each person? Every single person we're going to be speaking to is different. Every single person we're going to be speaking to, even though if you have kids, you know all the kids, you, your kids are different. How are you going to speak to each one? Paul's saying, let it be with grace. What I, what I want to be 
as I want to speak the truth with love and with grace in such a way, this is what I want to do, in such a way that the grace of God in a person, because they have Christ in them, the grace of God is actually activated within them, in their spirit, through my speech, so that they would want to do and have the power to do what I'm speaking in truth. See, I've heard preachers before, and when they're speaking, they're, they're speaking the truth, but there's something inside they're imparting to you. There's something inside they're imparting. They're imparting the grace of God so that when you're hearing them, you're like, yes, I want to fast. Wait, what? You know, you actually have a desire to fast or you have a desire to pray or you have this desire. That's grace working with truth. We don't naturally want to fast. We don't naturally want to pray. But the, the grace of God is on our speech. And it's not only speaking the truth. We need to do this. We need to do that. Yes, we do. But it's actually giving them the power to do what you're telling them. See, does your speech have that kind of ability? Even with your kids, you can speak to them in such a way that you, you know, just, just like it talks about in um, Zechariah chapter 4, speak grace, grace to the mountain, and it will be removed. You can speak the grace of God into, into anyone's spirit and give them, it stirs up even the grace of God in them, Jesus Christ, to empower them to live and do what you're calling them to do. That's the kind of messengers we want to be. We don't want, I've, I've, now I've heard other preachers, when they're speaking the truth, it's like condemnation, and it's like, I don't even want that, I, even though I should want it. In fact, you're preaching the same thing as other persons preaching, but your words are condemnation, and it actually makes you not even want to do it. I don't want to be one of those people that don't have the power of grace on my speech. The power of God. Grace is the power of God. Grace is the unmerited power of God to enable you to do what God has called you to do and to be who God's called you to be. We want that on our speech. It's like salt. You know, me and Angie went on a date uh, this past Thursday. And it was the first date we've had since Ireland. We went to this really nice restaurant in Florida at the beach. And I ordered sea bass stuffed with crab. And I was like, oh, man, this sounds awesome. And, it, and the, the arrangement was beautiful. And, I mean, it was just laid out perfectly. But it lacked flavor. I mean, it, and it was expensive. It was an expensive restaurant. And, you know, so I'm just like, can, can you give me some salt? You know, you shouldn't have to ask at a nice restaurant to put salt on your sea bass. It should come, I sound like a spoiled brat here, but anyway, it, it should come flavored if you're going to pay for that, right? So that's the way we want our speech to be. We don't want our speech just to be bland and without any flavor. We want our speech to actually impart the power, the power to do what we're calling them to do, the power of what God is speaking, the power of what God is saying. Just like the Lord said, let there be light, and there was light. The, the, not only did he speak the truth, but there was power in his words. We want power in our words. We want power to speak prophetically over people. See, so let's, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 14.3. As messengers, however, God will anoint us to speak a message. Starting in our homes with our spouse, starting in our homes with our, ki our kids, starting in the workplace. Then, you know, whether it's on a platform, whether it's pr prophesying over someone in the, in the congregation, our words want to be words of, that. here's what Paul says, but one who prophesies, Speaks to men for edification. That word means to build up. Speaks to one for exhortation. That means to um, spur them on. Hey, hey, go on with the Lord. Go on with the Lord. Don't stop. Don't quit. Don't, don't get discouraged. Don't stay here in self-pity. Come on. Go on with the Lord. Build them up. And to console them, to actually bring comfort to them. 
So your words can bring comfort to them. That your words can penetrate into them and they're going through a hard time. They might have fear. They might have anxiety. Your words can comfort them. See, that's what we want to be. We want to be, as we talk about divine order, we, it begins with our mouth and how we speak. Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth. We want to be full of grace and truth. See, it talks about Moses. It said the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, my words are spirit and my words are life. Are your words death or are your words life? Are your words imparting life into a situation, coming from your spirit, speaking from your spirit, or are your words imparting death? Are your words creating negativity? Are your words creating an environment of strife and contention? Are your words creating all this disunity? And are you the source of discord by your lips? Are you speaking life? Are you speaking grace? Are you building people up? Are you exhorting them on in love? Are you consoling them? Are you imparting grace to them? Do you have that power? Yes, you do. You have the power inside of you, the power of Jesus Christ, Christ himself. If you could just connect your tongue to your spirit and speak from your spirit, you would impart grace to those you speak to. You would impart power to those you speak to. You would impart life to those you speak to. See, God wants us functioning in divine order so that we're not like Messenger Mitch who always wants to correct everything that's wrong and wants to call everyone to repentance. Yes, there's times to, for that. Who always wants to confront, always wants to say, this is wrong, that's wrong, this wrong, that's wrong. No, Mitch, something's wrong with you internally. Get the inside of you fixed if you're going to speak outwardly. See, the wrong people are prophesying. The wrong people are saying is because something's wrong here. And it would be much better to get the wrong in here fixed by the, by the power of God than to keep spewing out negativity and, and the toxicness of speech. See, God wants to do that internal work so that we would be those messengers who speak the truth in love, who speak the truth with grace, who have the shepherd's heart, who have God's heart for his people. And having his heart, we impart the power for change in them so they can begin living the truth. That's what we want to be as a body functioning in divine order, getting the negativity out, getting the condemnation out. That doesn't mean we don't correct, because we do at times. But, but imparting his life to those who hear. Lord, I pray, help us. We all need help with this. Father, we ask you. Lord, we, we all need help with this, Lord. I need help with this. We all need help with this. Lord, just... If anyone can tame the tongue, they're a perfect man. They're a mature man. Lord, let us truly, Lord, have grace on our speech. Give us grace in our speech. Let us speak from the Spirit and not from the soul. Let us speak, God, out of the Holy Spirit and not from our mind, will, and emotions, not from our flesh, Lord. Help us. I know I'll be tested on this, God, and I'm, without your grace, we'll fail. Help us all, Lord, to truly learn to speak the truth with love, the truth with grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We can end the recording there. Let's wait on the Lord.